Darktable 4.8 is out now. And with it comes three new modules and a whole range of other features and tweaks. In this video, which will hopefully be part one of just a trilogy, we are going to look at the three new modules that have been introduced. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 141 of Understanding Darktable. I want to have a bit of a chat at the end about the documentation for Darktable, but first up, let's look at the three new modules. The first of these is the Color Equalizer. Now, if you've been with Darktable for a while, you would be familiar with the Color Zones module. The Color Equalizer module is essentially the same tool, but using a scene referred algorithm rather than a display referred algorithm. And if you've been here for a while, you would know we are trying to move away from anything that's display referred because it's prone to errors, it generates artifacts, it doesn't work with as much data, and it's just not as robust. So if you are completely new to Darktable and have never even seen the Colored Zones module, you, my friend, are in for a treat. So this is the Color Equalizer. It has three tabs, Hue, Saturation, and Brightness. And let's say I wanted to tweak the blue of the sky. What I could do is grab my eyedropper here, click on the blue of the sky. That will place this white line on this Hue swatch to say that is where the blue that you have selected sits in the middle of this graph. We can see that the node is actually not quite on that white line. That's where the node placement slider comes in. So we can drag those nodes left and right. So we'll just move that onto that white line. So now that node, if we boost it up, will shift the hue of that blue towards magenta. So if we do that, push it up like so, we can see that the sky has indeed shifted towards magenta. If we brought it down, we could shift it towards greens and yellows, like so. You'll notice that there is a white line that passes through all of those nodes. That is essentially showing you the bandwidth of that filter. And if we use the hue curve slider, we can narrow that bandwidth so that less frequencies either side or in this case, less hues or fewer hues either side are affected by the filter. We're, we're just narrowing it down to a tighter range of hue. Maybe we didn't actually want to change the hue. Maybe what we wanted to do was change the saturation. Okay, fine. Come over to the saturation tab, push it up to saturate more like so, or drag it down to desaturate the sky like so. Double click to reset. Brightness does exactly the same thing. If we just wanted to darken the blue of the sky, we can do that. Or we could lighten the blue of the sky. Now, as I alluded to before, Darktable 4.8 has dropped, but the supporting documentation has not yet been written. So I'm not sure what these other sliders are doing. I've had a bit of a play, and I will confess I've come up a little bit bewildered as to what their intention is. So until the documentation arrives, I'm just going to leave it here for the color equalizer module. And we will move on right now to the next module, which is Enlarge Canvas. Now, the Enlarge Canvas module is designed to allow you to expand the area of the frame outside of what you currently have. Now, what I've got here is an uncropped image of my car, which I'm trying to sell. If you're looking for a V8 Fairlane, let me know. So, percent left. Let's say I want 10% extra area on the left-hand side of my image. I simply dial in 10 and I've got exactly that. I did that with a right click, by the way. I could do the same on the right-hand side. And there we go. We've got an extra 10% on either side of our image. Now the idea here is that you would then use either the retouch tool or the liquify tool to either push pixels with the liquify tool or essentially copy and paste with the retouch tool 
pixels from within the image out into this extra area that you've created. So let's suppose I come over to Retouch, I've created a second instance of Retouch and I've called it Enlarge. I will go with a path. Now, the default algorithm is for the healing mode. I'm just going to leave it on that for a minute. And don't worry, we are going to get back to the Enlarge module in a sec, don't worry. I am going to say, well, I want to go from here, down to here, across to here, up to here, and we'll close that off. And I want to extend my frame over that way. So now I bring this source box over to here, and suddenly it jumps into line and does what I want it to do. And then I've got to move this up a little bit to try and blend the horizon line of that bitumen where it disappears into the foliage of the trees in the background. So now I've got something like that. But as you can see, there's all this green smearing from this garish green that is the enlarged canvas. Let's jump back and have a look at this enlarged canvas module because there are five colors for you to choose from for the enlarged area. Your three primaries, green, red, blue, black and white. I'd love to see gray in there as well, but anyway, it's what we've got. So if we change that over to black, it's a little less obvious, but we still have a lot of work to do here. Now, I'm not entirely convinced of the utility of this enlarged canvas module, but let's just try and fill this area with some more of this bitumen so that we can you know, extend our frame the way we wanted to. But let's just try using clone rather than healing and we'll go with a path again. And I'll just go control click, control click, control click, control click, close that off. And we will simply move this over to here like so. And this is what we've got. Now, it's okay, but it's not brilliant. You can see where the merge is. And if I, I suppose I can try and push the, the feather out a little bit further to try and create a smoother blend, but you're not always going to have that much pixel data to work with. I'm just gonna do one more so I can try and get that last little bit filled in so that we can extend our yeah, see, that's because of the size of the feather on this shape here, we're picking up the shadow underneath the front wheel of the car. So I'll have to drag this box across this way a bit. So now we've got something like that. And I can now see that there's an issue here where we've got a, an echo of the front bumper of the car. So that's no good. So I'm going to go back. And I'm going to tweak this again, move it across a bit further. Still not quite happy with the placement of that. Uh, yeah, like I said, I'm not entirely convinced of the usefulness of this feature. And for my personal opinion, this is going down a route that I don't want to see Darktable go. I would much rather Darktable stuck to editing one image at a time and doing it really well. I genuinely feel like Darktable is the best in class for any software that does raw development. And I don't want to see it go down this compositing path, you know, because the third module is a compositing module. But that's just me. I, you know, I'm just one guy. My opinion counts for nothing. I'm just saying I don't see a lot of use for this between these two, you know, approaches, you know, the enlarged canvas to enlarge the canvas and then using either retouch or liquify to move pixels into that expanded area. I don't know, each to their own. It's not my thing, I will be honest. I've been playing with this for the, I don't know, 10 days that Darktable 4.8 has been out. Actually, I was playing with it before Darktable 4.8 came out. I was using 4.7 and I don't see myself ever using this. If I wanted to do this sort of stuff, to expand the area. I would much rather just export, you know, a 16-bit TIFF and then open it up in GIMP or Affinity Photo or God forbid, Potato Shop and do my editing in an application that is designed to do that kind of stuff well. Anyway, enough of a rant. I feel like I'm ranting a lot in this episode. So that is the Enlarge Canvas 
module. And as I said, the third module is the overlay module, which has actually changed name. The third new module was, at the time that Pascal wrote the release notes, called Overlay. However, if we search for Overlay, what we find is a module called Composite. So just be aware that it obviously changed its name after the release notes were written, but before the software dropped. The idea of this module is that you can take the same image or any other image from your film strip and drag that image onto this box and that will create an overlay of the two images. We can see that there is an opacity slider, does exactly what you would expect it to do, reduces the opacity. There is a rotation slider, also does what it says on the tin, rotates the image that we are overlaying. And there is a scale slider which will allow you to reduce the size of the overlaid image. Next up, we've got some bounding boxes for alignment. So we can go put it on the left side, put it on the right side, put it in the top left corner. We can see that most of that overlaid image is actually outside of our original image here. Maybe what we need to do is introduce a little bit of an X offset and a little bit of a Y offset. And now we've brought our overlaid image into the bounds of our entire frame. It would be lovely if you could just click and drag to where you wanted it to sit because this moving the sliders thing is a little bit laggy, as you can see. My system, whilst being three or four years old, I wouldn't say it was a slouch. I'm running a Ryzen 2700X. I've got 32 gigs of system RAM. The operating system is installed on an NVMe drive, M.2, and the graphics card is an RTX 3070 with eight gigs of RAM. So not quite up to today's specs, but still a pretty decent system. But that is quite laggy for dragging these sliders around. So it'd be lovely if you could just grab that image and go, I want it right here, or I want it up there or whatever. But anyway, maybe that'll come in a future version. That is the basics. You'll also see you can scale on the larger border, the smaller border, the height or advanced options. Advanced options gives us scale marker. Oh, I hadn't even looked at these things. Larger scale marker. What does... Yeah, I get that that's the scale of the overlay, but what does scale marker to larger image border mean? Scale marker reference, marker width, marker height. Wow. Okay. I don't quite get that. And again, this comes down to the fact that there is no documentation yet. I'll leave it there. You get the basic idea here that you can composite one image over the top of another with some basic control. Now, I want to address this issue of the documentation. I raised the point on the Darktable unofficial group on Facebook about the fact that, you know, this new version of Darktable has dropped and this is not the first time this has happened. And there is no supporting documentation. There is no updated version of the user manual for 4.8. And as I'm recording this, it's 10 days, I think, since the software was released. And it turns out that there's a, one guy, Chris, who's doing it all by himself. And I said, but mate, why? What, why are you having to write the documentation? Why is it not the job of the person who writes the code for new feature, new module, whatever it happens to be, because they're the ones who've written the new toy, they know how it works. Why are they not supplying the written documentation? And why is it not being done before the software ships? And he said, well, as for when they do it, the maintainer doesn't enforce that rule. So it's up to the people who are writing the code to just submit the documentation when they feel like it, which I find odd. And then Bill, who's one of the developers, he wrote back, with because I then submitted a not a bug or a feature request, but I, I posed the question on GitHub about why the uh, sorry, not on GitHub on the um, Darktable dev email list. And I said, why is this? Why is the software released without the supporting 
user manual. And Bill came back to me and he goes, okay, think of it this way. As a developer, I write a piece of code that takes A and creates output B. He said, and I've got an idea for what that's meant to do and how it's meant to work. And I submit the code to GitHub, it gets merged into the master and other people start using it. And suddenly you've got the vagaries of different Linux distributions and different operating systems like Mac and Windows, and maybe things don't behave the same way to the environment in which the module was written by Bill or any other developer for that matter. Or you've got users who suddenly go, oh, well, that's great, but what if it could do this as well? He said, and so then you've got to go back and you've got to tweak and you've got to modify and you've got to incorporate other things. And, and it's a constantly shifting set of goalposts all the way up to the point of packaging it ready for the deployment of a new stable version of Darktable. Now, I, I kind of get where he's coming from. I understand it. But I just think, what, why is there not just an extra timeline marker. Because Pascal, who maintains the whole Darktable project, he sets these dates. You know, he'll send out an email to the developers and say, we're approaching the next stable release. So there's a string freeze on this date and there's a feature freeze on this date. And there's a there are these timeline markers that the developers have to adhere to. So I'm wondering, why not just have one that says, Supporting documentation must be submitted by this date, you know, which is X number of days or weeks prior to the release of the software. I don't know. Seems odd. I get it. It's free and open source software and it's, you know, lots of guys who are you know, like me sitting in a bedroom somewhere around the planet working on this in their own time, not getting paid for it. So, I, I, you know, I get it. Every, you know, we've all got demands on our time. And, we, you know, it's not a project like, you know, Adobe Potato Shop where you've got hundreds of people working on it and millions of dollars of you know, resources to ensure that all of these things happen. I, I get it. It's a completely different playing field. But it just does seem an odd decision to my mind anyway that this software gets released and every single user is impacted by the fact that there's no documentation on day one. I mean, you know, I'm sitting here trying to work out what scale marker means because there is no documentation. Ah, anyway, just one of those things, I guess. It's the price we pay for using free software. I mean, and you know, I love this software. I absolutely do. And I genuinely believe that when it comes to a piece of software for editing and developing raw files, I really believe Darktable is the best in class. I really do. I think, I, no argument, I think it's better than Lightroom by a long shot. You know, it took me a long time to wrap my head around it, I'll confess, but, you know, now that I understand it the way I do, I genuinely have not seen anything else that comes close. I absolutely tip my hat to all of the developers. You know, as much as I rip them a new one every now and again for things like this, I, I absolutely tip my hat to them because it's a fantastic piece of software and the work they do is amazing. And the fact that they do it for free and they do it in their spare time, like I do with my videos, it's a credit to the whole project. Anyway, I will leave that there. In the next video, we will look at some more of the features which did not appear in the big ones as denoted by Pascal in the release notes because in my mind the best new feature of Darktable 4.8 was not mentioned in the big ones. I think Pascal buried the lead. I really do. <laughs> anyway, I will tell you about that in the next video. Questions, comments, sing out down below and I will catch you in the next one.